Marta, we'll begin in Matthew 15. I want to teach uh, toward Isaiah 58 so that it'll make it easy for all of us to kind of get on the same point of agreement and faith and spirit for this fast on Wednesday. Lord began ministering that to me about two weeks ago. I think I'm going to just start teaching. So I'll kind of jump into where I was in the first service because I, I believe the Lord wants me to share a story. It's so amazing that if it wasn't in the Bible, it would probably be are impossible to believe. And it's a kind of an obscure story that you may never have even heard before, but the Lord brought it to my attention as he tried to illustrate the power of humility and pride and the force of either. So let's see if we can get there. So Matthew 15. The scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Again, this was not mommy telling you to get those dirty hands clean before you eat dinner. Hygiene, it was a tradition. It's still practiced to this day in Jerusalem among the Orthodox that there's a certain uh, protocol of washing your hands in all settings as, as to separate and make you, you know, unto the Lord. And that's what obviously wasn't happening here. They were just fishermen getting hungry. So he answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. See, that you're, you're transgressing tradition. Now he's saying you're undoing commandment through tradition. So here's a story. For God commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses his father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me, it is a gift, is a gift of God. And then he need not honor his father or mother, thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Mark 7 tells the same story, and he uses the word Corban, an interesting word because what it meant is just this verse. It, it's what was yours to give to care for your parents, emotion, finance, whatever. You have turned and given it to God, and now you are no longer responsible for the commandment of caring and loving your parents, honoring them. Corban. Uh, when we first got married, we had our first son, Nathan. We were youth pastors in a church in Moore Park. We had a member in our church that was hosting us, doing a home group, and his name was Bruce. And he had his 50th birthday, and they were celebrating. Or maybe it was his wife. I forget exactly. But also, Cammie's dad was having his 50th birthday celebration. And it was just kind of an obvious to me which is, I take all the credit for being stupid, that, you know, we ought to be at this place because of the church and because of the family there, and they were, they were part of our life, and we, they were a blessing in our life. And, you know, anyway, we went to the party, and at the end of the day, at the end of the evening, we had a babysitter taking care of little Nathan. Just felt really convicted. You know, again, Cammie's just joyfully following me, you know, knowing she'd learned the secret of always duck and let God hit me. That's ladies, that's what you do. You don't make a fuss about it. God will get your husband if you can kind of just do that, you know? <laughs> Bam! Honey, did you see that? Yeah! <laughs> so I come home, and I'm telling Cammy while we're driving home, I say, gosh, this, I just feel like this is really Corbin, what we just did. You know, we were, here's your dad's having a birthday. We just said no to him because we had to work and blah, blah, blah. So make a long story short, Called the babysitter, asked, if, can you stay a little longer with our, and we're going to drive back into Camarillo and, and uh, go see Cammy's dad for his 50th. That's what Corbin is, where you can get confused, and one, one lets you off the other. And Jesus is just talking to them about this issue. So he says, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So... One of the hardest things I have is to keep my heart and my mouth in sync so that my mouth especially represents a heart that's in communion with the Lord. It's impossible to be anywhere other than where your heart is. We've all been in conversations, again, that you're talking to somebody and they're, they're not listening and because their heart's somewhere else. We could be at work and our heart's not there. We could be at home and our heart's not there. We could be in church and our heart's not there. We can be in a relationship and our heart's not there. 
And where the heart is, is determining everything. So this idea that you could worship God, honor him with your lips, but heart be far from us, is that's when life really gets double-minded. Why in James 4, he says, uh, 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 purify your hearts, you double-minded. Bring them back into one focus. And he says, in vain, they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So now what's happening is uh, the disconnect of the heart in fellowship and union with God in his spirit and in his word have now, uh, that's kind of moved off to a place where there are new rules that are traditions that have come and there are focuses. And it's kind of, what happens is we go more external than we live internally. We can, uh, what we're talking about today in, in um, pride or self-righteousness is not that what comes from riotous living. There are people in the world that feel super cocky, super confident. They've got gazillion dollars of money. They're loved and famous, and they can just think they can do anything, say anything. That, we can go, oh, yeah, that's like, that's come out of that place you're at. For us, who are trying to live righteously, our pride comes in our effort to observe and do and not do and keep away from and not touch. And, and sometimes it's a lot harder for us to see pride because it hides itself inside of righteousness, right? And in probably the only time we can see it is if we look into another religion and see some adherent of another religion in a, in a crazy Corbin map moment. We go, gosh, that's, so, what, that's ridiculous what you're having to do. But when we're inside of it, we think it's actually, we're doing it for the Lord. So uh, what happens is Jesus goes on. Let me just finish the story. So he says, he called the multitude to himself and said, hear and understand. What goes into the mouth does not defile a man, but what comes out of the mouth defiles a man. And his disciples said, well, don't you know the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? And he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted and let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a ditch. God isn't nearly as in, in worried about us correcting or fixing other people. He's just always about our heart with him. Peter answered and said, well, explain this parable to us. He said, well, okay. Are you still without some understanding? Do you not understand? Whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So... Jesus was introducing again and again that the law that we were to live in, which was going to be put in our mind, written on our heart, by a relationship with Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit actively involved in our quiet time with him, would begin to, uh, would be the relationship of the inside, not the outside. And we all can make our outside look beautiful, but be full of dead bones and all this manner of heart issues. So... What happens is we hear God, we meet him, he touches our life, we come into a relationship, we believe in Jesus, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. That's the beginning. Confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. That completes it and seals it and salvation is given and I'm inside salvation and I'm inside a relationship and now I get to journey in this new place of faith. And that I believe God raised him from the dead, I confess with my mouth he is Lord and so now I'm going to live in that place. There comes joy, there comes hope, there comes excitement, there comes the word of God comes alive, prayer becomes a joy, and praise is exciting. But over time, those things, they have to be re reawakened in my heart, or otherwise they just kind of become things I do, traditions I keep. And maybe I get focused on one area, one of those things I just said, prayer, praise, the word, and now I begin to become a student and a focused one. And then I begin to apply myself. Galatians says that we can begin in the spirit and then end up doing what we were doing with our flesh. We can begin anything we hear from God in faith 
and soon turn it into works. We can be in a place that's grace, and it soon becomes law. And when we're here, we're dying and drying up. And, and yet it's hard to see because we don't understand that it's a heart issue. We think it's an external issue. And so we tend to get even more uh, frustrated with people or impatient. That's how I always know my heart shift has left the Lord's fellowship. And I've gone into works in the flesh is when I have frustration, impatience. Uh, when because then my heart is no longer in this trusting, adoring, grateful place of salvation. I'm no longer in the forgiveness. I'm starting to be the righteous. And I don't know about you, but there's only one righteous. And that's definitely Jesus, not me. Now, I, he makes me righteous by believing, but I'm not able to sustain righteousness by doing. And, it, and in fact, ever... I in, in whatever I endeavor to do, the, the promise in Romans 7 and in Corinthians is that I will end up not doing what I endeavored to do, and the very thing I did not want to do, I'll start doing. So that's the problem about righteous living. If that's the focus of our life, righteous living, then we, are, we, are, we have just reinterpreted the law of Moses into a Christian form, and we've denied Christ, and we start to fall from grace, and we just get into a real place of frustration. So I want to go to Isaiah 58 and show you uh, a picture of the fast. And for the hope, I believe, that every one of us will go, wow, I could use with that. I, could, I, 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 could, I would like that to happen to me. So Isaiah 58, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily, and they delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinances of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice, and they take delights in approaching God. So on the outside, there's no fault in this group, and God does not counter this as a charge that that's not true, you're a bunch of hypocrites. This is indeed their external, internal desire, their effort. But they're suffering like we suffer, like I suffer, that after a bit of time, I'm frustrated. And again, that's my first sign that I'm focusing on my righteous living instead of my righteous king. Is I'm frustrated on how things are turning out. So they said, why have we fasted? and you've not seen. And why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, now, now God is answering. In fact, the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers, drive hard your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate, to strike with the fist of wickedness. You'll not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. The one thing we do not want to try to do in a church fast is to use the fast as a means of forcing an agenda or controlling an outcome. Have you ever prayed over somebody that you want to change them? How well did that go? I mean, it's really some form of control, even if it's in the name of Jesus, for the, bet for the betterment of their life. It's still control, and God just will back off. We can pray for them to discover the Lord, for the, for the revelation of Jesus to come, to grant them grace and favor, and we can extend the kingdom over them in a fashion that releases them from the debts that they're incurring, that forgiveness begins to flow, that goodness starts finding them, that forbearance captures them, and all of the kindness of God begins to surround them and draw them into his embrace. And that's pretty powerful because that's usually not how you feel by the time people aren't obeying you. <laughs> right? You're... Wrath of God gets you. But the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. The frustration, the anger. When I feel that intensity, I remember once uh, early on in our church, I was, heard something about somebody, did, and I just like, oh, that is so wrong. I was after Sunday service, and I just, there I was in my bedroom, and I saw the phone. I just knew I needed to call that guy. 
And then I heard that little scripture, the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. I quickly dismissed that voice. <laughs> went right to the phone. Got on the phone and gave this man a piece of my mind. And sub, sub, consequently blew everything into pieces. And then the Lord said again, the, righteous, the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. I know. <laughs> but it, that's, that's the problem about your soul. Your soul has the capacity to, pull, to, to hijack your life, force you to go into directions you really don't want to go, but you just got to get a release. You got to get, get it out. You've got to get results. And when we fast to try to obtain something, <clears throat> we're not moving ourselves to the real issue because the issue isn't out there. The issue's in here. Everything God's doing, I see in my life right now, is to, try my, to draw my heart to him and my heart to each other. So he says, is this the fast that I've chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head with a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? So a lot of times we think that by our Subje uh, subjecting ourselves to, you know, like, oh, I'm such a bad person, and all oh, things are so, you know. It's a lot of, lot of kind of mind games we can get into on a fast. And except now he begins to prescribe this really simple and you know, surprising, and doesn't even address food. So that's why it's kind of a cool idea. Is this not the fast I've chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. Again, I feel like, for me, when I come to a fasting season, the thing that gets, starts to be dismantled is my issues that I have accumulated in my righteous living and that I need to bring resolution, which all come to forgiveness. I have to release people. I have, to, I have to take off burdens, and I have to let those that I have oppressed. Again, a lot of things that happen in our life, we never, they never actually work out publicly. They just work out inside our heart. <clears throat> I was telling our uh, father's heart, or I forget who I was telling in the mansions, that the hardest part about me having a, a, a place, a, a conversation with God, is that once I actually encounter the Lord and he begins speaking and we begin to hear and begin to interchange, he quickly can turn into a sermon. And the message can soon become, a, it's not a, me and him talking, it's me and giving you a message. You, don't, you would never know how many times you invade my prayer life. <laughs> like you just show up right there. And, I go, and then I'm having a conversation. I'm seeing me say to you. And I, about five years ago, the Lord I had to just do a, I, I, I began to see how much it robbed my fellowship with the Lord. And so I had to start saying to myself, I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to talk to invisible people. Right? I'm not going to talk to invisible people. I'm going to talk to you, my God. So whatever we have, it's between me and you and you and me. If you, there's, I have a calling to minister your word but I don't want to miss the word touching me by just having it go shh like that. And it's a powerful thing. You, you've all, we've all had that at, when we left our boss at work. We had a conversation. We tried to share an issue. We didn't think we said it right. The rest of the day, what do we think about? Having that conversation over again. We have the conversation over again. We've all had it with people and members and our, our, our spouse. I'm going to sit down. We're going to try to share. You try to work out 16 ways to get the dummy to see what you're trying to share. <laughs> and the more you work it out, you know, and then, again, and what happens usually? The dummy doesn't see what you're trying to share, and you get angry, or vice versa. And next thing you know, you, your emotions have erupted. Because really, the issue is not the issue. The issue is control. And the control of trying to get somebody to please, to perform so that you will feel good about yourself has forced an issue of frustration, and there's a whole lot of emotions here. And we're going to have to have a way to let those emotions out. And in the, in the Bible and in church, it's called 
a fight. We're going to express our emotions. And if we don't know how to fight a fair fight, we'll blame each other for right and wrong instead of how I feel and how this has left me feeling and trying to take ownership for what, how I'm responding. Because sin, your sin is not what I did to you. Your sin is how you responded to what I did to you. Do you understand that? You cannot be done, undone by what I did to you if you respond in Christ. Christ will supersede and override what has been done to you and make it for good. Even when you do the wrong thing, he'll still turn it around. Because he's always redeeming. All he knows is redemption. And it's not about right and wrong. It's about forgiveness. It's about his paying the price and making us free. So having conversations, trying to force things to go. He says, don't do it. It's not the time to share bread with the hungry and bring, your, bring those to your house who are uh, poor and who cast out, who see the naked and, let, and cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. The whole idea of the Corbin, responding, get, being touched again by humanity. Come off of the issues that you're striving and driving. Be touched. Then your light will break forth like morning and your healing will spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer and you shall cry and he'll say, here I am. If you take away, here's a summation again. If you take away the yoke from your midst, and the pointing of the finger and the speaking of wickedness. If we lift off during the day of Wednesday, yokes, yokes we've placed on those we love, those we hate, our politicians, our presidents, our religious leaders, whoever they are, we can yoke a whole lot of people. How many tellers have you yoked in the bank? Oh, God, if I was their boss. How many yokes have you put on yourself? Taking off yokes, taking off the pointing of the finger, the exposing of nakedness. Like, like when Noah came out of the ark and he had got drunk and got himself naked and his son uh, Ham saw it. He went and told his other brothers, Daddy's naked. What a sight. The Shem and Jephna, they both grab a blanket. One of them holds it on their shoulder here. Another holds it on his shoulder here. They walk in backwards into the tent, cover their dad, never look, walk out. Noah wakes up and he knows what's happened to him and he curses him for being... There. You see, there's no glory in exposing nakedness. There's only... The, the glory is when love can override because love will cover the multitude of sins. And because lawlessness is increasing in the day, our love will grow cold. And all, the more love grows cold, the more laws we increase. And we are people that are not to live in that realm because that's not who we're called to be. We're called to be sons of the Most High and forgive and release and let go and, and take away the pointing of the finger or the speaking of wickedness. To, to you know, yell at a TV, to argue with somebody who's, who we don't think is right. I mean, right now, if you haven't noticed, the whole society is growing so intense. You say, this is so wrong. I'll tell you the problem it's as simple as it's been growing for at least 40 years. It's called righteousness fighting righteousness. Right fighting right. And then as long as we're right fighting right, we will forever just amp it up until something just something so collapses that people can actually consider another thought that maybe my right did not give me the right to act like a donkey. I was going to use another word, but I stopped. <laughs> I needed to walk in humility. I walked in kindness, walk in love. So it wasn't about the right. It was about the response. So you see, it's just, it's just happening. But he says, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted, then your light will dawn in darkness and your darkness will be as a noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually, satisfy your soul in drought, strengthen your bones. You'll be like a well-watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. I mean, this, here is a beautiful... You know, on Wednesday, we'll, we'll, we'll pray into all of this promise because there's just so much there. I mean, it's, it's right there. We're talking about societal reformation out of a heart response to God. Everything starts with a heart response to God and it can go to the point of touching all society. But it takes one of us, then some of us, 
that begin to be touched by me. It's like the old song, it's not my brother, it's not my sister, not my mother, not my father. It's me standing in the need of prayer. It's my heart that has to be released from the, the frustration or the, or the, the, or the double-mindedness and the straining gnats and swallowing camel issues. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and you shall honor me in doing your, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. We're not trying to get Saturday to be a day off. We're trying to learn to live in the rest of God. To me, that is far more demanding to rest and cease from my striving, to live in trust, to enlarge what Jesus did as being all sufficient in all set settings and all times, to continue to surrender, to disengage from that mistaken tone of distrust and despair, instead to agree with trust and to agree with hope and to not, 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 not accuse God of not being faithful, but to, to um, rest inside of his faithfulness. That's, to us, the New Covenant people, the New Testament believers. We're now trying to learn how to live that. But he says, when you, when I, when you make that your goal, then you will delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll cause you to ride on the high hills and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Okay, so... That's so huge, and I really encourage you to just pray. You could take anything off the list of Isaiah 58 and let that be the fast. It doesn't even have to be food. Food sometimes is a way of reminding us, oh, yeah, this is a different day than the day I'm in. But, but it by no means is the focus point because then we go external instead of internal. Okay, two quick things. Uh, turn with me. I'll do this in 10 minutes. So that might be a lie. I want to read this in the Bible. There's two places. Now I'm just going to do one because I don't have time. Go to, uh, 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 we're going to go to uh, Daniel chapter 4, I believe. Daniel chapter 4. I want to make sure that's true. Yeah, Daniel chapter 4. No, I, I can't do the other one too. I'm sorry. 1 Kings 21, 27. 1 Kings 21, 27. I'll tell you the story. Ahab, bad king. Boo. Jezebel, bad queen. Ew. Ahab wanted a vineyard of somebody named Naboth. And the vineyard, he wanted to turn it into a garden. He tried to buy it. Naboth said, this is my father's inheritance. I can't sell it to you. So he goes home and he sulks. And Jezebel says, what are you sulking about? You're the king of, you're the king of Israel. Oh, I can't get this vineyard I want to make a garden out, a vegetable garden. Oh, Come on, you're the king of Israel. Just you go, you go, you be happy again. I'll take care of everything. Which never accuse a Jezebel because you've got to have an Ahab. You've got to have a manipulator to manipulate. You've got to start the whole story of movement. Oh, I just, I don't feel loved. <laughs> just don't feel loved <laughs> at a church. No, nobody ever seems to notice me. They don't notice you. Let me take care of that. <laughs> Takes two to tango. Anyway, story goes, Jezebel trumps up charges against Naboth, and uh, he is taken to court, and he is stoned and dead. She goes into uh, Ahab's home and says, he's dead. You can have your garden. Ahab's happy gets his garden. God is not happy. He goes to Elijah and says, I want you to talk to Ahab. And basically says, Ahab, everything in your life is dead. I'm going to kill your kids. I'm going to, we're going to exterminate your name off the planet for what you did. I mean, you just, you just, and he just lays it on him. And then in chapter, verse 27, here's what happens. Verse 21, verse Chapter 21, verse 27. So it was when Ahab heard these words, I paraphrased the whole story, that he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth on his body, and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. <sighs> See, there is so much power in humility. 
you can alter the course of anything. So the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, catch this. God now talking to the prophet. See how Ahab humbled himself before me? Ahab, boo, bad man, wicked king. God's attracted to Ahab's humility. Because he's humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. On the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. God changed the course that he was set on because of humility. Now, now go to this one. This story will blow you away. This is in Second Daniel chapter 4. This is about the greatest king that ever lived on the planet next to Jesus Christ, who is now the greatest king on the planet and on the earth, in the heaven and everywhere. <sighs> Nebuchadnezzar, God's servant raised up to, to, to punish Israel, to take Judah captive, to destroy Jerusalem. Mighty king. He has a dream. Nebuchadnezzar the king. Will you let me read this? I'm going to read this chapter because it's too big to tell you the story. You won't believe me if I, if I don't read it. You'll think he's just making that up. Nebuchadnezzar the king. He's writing a letter. Puts it in the book. To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest at my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream. But they did not, know, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. But at last Daniel came before me, his name is Belshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. I told the dream before him, saying, Belshazzar, chief of the musicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dreams that I have seen and its interpretation. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking. And behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beast go out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump, the roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze. In the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven. And let him graze with the beast on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed that of a, from that of a man, and let him be given the heart of a beast. And let seven times pass over him. We don't know what seven times. It's got to be at least months. It might have been years. This decision is by the decree of the watchers, and the sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men, gives it to whomever he wills, and sets over it the lowest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belshazzar, that's Daniel, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able, for the Spirit of the Holy God is in you. Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belshazzar, 
Do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you and its interpretation concern your enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which couldn't be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt and the, whose branches the birds of heaven had their home. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. For your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the end of the earth. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts of the field to seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven and seven times shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. And I love that little phrase, heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this a great Babylon that I have built? for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like an oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. At the end of the time, which I'd probably lean more to seven years, but even seven months would be incredible if you put it in any normal place of today to lose that much power and to be... Well, let's see what happens. At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned. And I blessed the Most High and I praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me and I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. This is a fabulous story. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth, and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. Crazy. He was restored. I'm going to find Daniel real quick because the next chapter I want to just read a verse. His son, Belshazzar, not Bel, is a little, is shortened version of Daniel's name, becomes king. And he doesn't learn anything from observing his father. And so what happens is on the day of a feast, 
he's getting so happy that he calls for all of the golden and silver and all the utensils of the, of the temple that his father Nebuchadnezzar had brought back. And he brings them into the party and they start filling the golden cups and so forth with wine and they start praising the God of gold and the God of silver. And all of a sudden a hand shows up and writes, meeny, meeny. You know, and just, and he, everybody just, they go pale. And they lose their, they lose all their confidence and they're trying to figure out what in the world does this mean? And they remember there's a man, Daniel, and he's old now. So years have gone by, maybe 14 years Except, you know, he's king, Nebuchadnezzar is no longer alive. And um, verse 17 of chapter 5, Daniel. I, just want to, I want you to hear this exchange because this again is for us. Then Daniel answered and said to the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty glory and honor. Man, I'm starting to feel like I got to, you know, I was telling you the other day I'm repenting of whining chronicles. Our life is what God wants it to be right now. Let's get a hold of God and it'll be different if he wants it to be. We don't have to blame one another or accuse one another or go backwards or forwards to try to change where we are. We just need to get a hold of God. And acknowledge again him to be supreme and sovereign and great and good and kind and let the heart transformation. But here's this one man. And because of his majesty, he gave him all peoples, nations, and languages, and they trembled and feared before him. There's nothing like any, we don't, we don't have a country in the world that operates like this. If it does, it's a dinky little speck on the, on the planet with a small group of people. Whoever he wished, he executed Whoever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and I wanted to use this because this is now Daniel interpreting what we, Nebuchadnezzar wrote about. When his heart was lifted up and, and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was depossessed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with dew of heaven till he knew, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. Although you knew all this. And you've lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. And you've brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you praise the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone. And you do not see or hear or know that God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways you have not glorified. Think of that. God holds my breath, your breath, our breath in his hand. Here's another breath, Steve. Here's another one. We think, we take it for granted that every breath is already ours, but it's hand offered. One, just all you have to do is withhold one breath and it's the end. And he owns all our ways, our entire future. He, he, can, he can alter anything and everything. It's all his to do with what he pleases. And we get all tied up inside. And then we get tied up outside. And then we get pointing fingers. And then we try to either praise ourselves or blame ourselves or we just live in self when God is delights in releasing us from self. And that's what I believe is the spirit behind the, uh, our fast. And however God would give you confidence. I just feel like I need to pray and we'll close. Father, these stories are so sobering. I read them this morning again. Whew, I'm just humbling myself any way I knew how to. Lord, I am that man. I've never been a Nebuchadnezzar in the fame and fortune and power and might or sovereign choice of you. But I've often been 
arrogant and haughty. And, and I also often been frustrated in service and been like Ahab, sit around and feel like I can't be happy anymore because I can't have somebody's vineyard. I, God, I recognize the arrogance of my heart and the pride. And we just hunt, we just pause for a moment in sobriety. You are God most high. And the kingdoms of the earth, every kingdom of the earth is yours. And you give it to whomever you please, even to the lowest of men. Lord, we, bought, we, we, we humble ourselves like Ahab did to take a moment and go, you know, my selfishness has now brought me into this trouble I'm in. I take ownership for my issues. And I want to take responsibility and I want to be released and I want to be forgiven and I want to be free and I want to get out of my whatever I'm in. Lord, we take comfort in that in an appointed time of discipline, you will lead us to a certain point which then you'll restore to us both our reasoning and our praise. And we'll be able to lift up our eyes to heaven and understand who it is who's ruling. Lord, as a church, we, we thank you for the great years of of service and the many things you've allowed us to see and do and be. And we lift up our lives and so many of us have walked with you for decades upon decades. And yet now, at this just juncture, we wish to come and learn to, to let go, to forgive, to release, to be forgiven and to be released, and to return again to sovereignty. Lord, to accept our circumstances as not the issue that we're really wrestling with, but you and me, us, together, one and us individually with you, to let and release each other from burdens and responsibilities, expectations, to go backwards into the past and let go of our parents and school teachers and past associates and marriages and release everyone we possibly can so that there is nothing we are attaching ourselves to as the problem, and be only alone with you. Lord, thank you that you've not driven us to live in the grass and eat grass. The greatest man that ever lived on the planet was humbled in the greatest way that I had ever been. And yet, Lord, when you choose to restore, you can restore anybody, anything, and anyone. So we just pause and humble ourselves and ask that you grant us grace in this week of humility, without us being drawn into false humility and funky stuff that goes into berating ourselves and being religious in our humility, but truly just be able to look upon the goodness of God. Pour out your spirit. Let your blood come. Where our traditions have taken over your simple commands, let them fall off. Where we're straining gnats and swallowing camels, let us recognize it. Where our eyes have become blinded because of our own pride God, take the scales off. We thank you for being good and kind. We humble ourselves. We humble ourselves. We release everyone, and we ask for mercy in every situation, every life. Everyone connected to us, associated with us, for our nation. We, 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 we ask for, him, for grace to every situation. and We do not want justice in any place. We want forgiveness and mercy to abound. Please come. Begin with us. And do amazing, amazing liberation through Jesus Christ. And grant grace afresh and new, and joy afresh and new, and hope afresh and new as we encounter you. We thank you for doing this because you can, and we put, put ourselves in this place before you through this week, and we pray you will grant us supernatural, supernatural grace for these things to actually be exchanged and taken place in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the sobriety clap. <laughs> Ministry teams will be up. God bless you. Have a good day. We'll see you on Wednesday.